Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to avoid the hospital. You got to safeguard yourself. And I always say, you know, we're not in the Dr. Welby era, era anymore. It's Dr. Oz. Okay, uh, you know, you've got to take care of yourself. You have to know things before you go into the hospital. And the first thing we'll go through is advocacy. You know, that's a term that we hear all the time, and, and I don't think people truly understand this. Before you, before you leave tonight, you should be thinking about, I need to have an advocate. Now, people get mixed up and say, I have a uh, I have a health power of attorney, and I have that, and that's not that. <clears throat> an advocate is someone who's going to know, not know, is going to know how you need to, um, how, that you need to understand certain things. They need to be your companion. They need to go to the doctor with you because often people don't hear everything. And if they have someone with you, they can write it down. And I don't know if you saw recently in, in the newspaper, they now have um, senior citizens who go around with other people um, and to the doctor's visits and they just sit there and they take notes. And it was kind of cute, the article, because she had an older person there and she had a stenography. Some of you people, I know you, the tablets. Like she was taking shorthand. And she was sitting there. The patient was talking to the doctor. She was just writing everything down. And it started because often people's, the, the children live in another city or another state. <clears throat> and then when they ask mom, you know, what happened at the doctor? Well, you don't get the whole message. <clears throat> So these people then have the notes, and they can send it to the children. So I think that's what an advocate is. They need to listen for you. They need to tell you. They need to ask questions. So you need to have an advocate. And it doesn't have to be your spouse. It's got to be someone who trusts you. They're not going to be making your end-of-life decisions. They're just going to be there to be your eyes, your ears, when you just kind of have zoned out after they've told you something. So that's the first thing. The second thing is informed consent. People will get a little concerned about this. You know what? Informed consent doesn't carry much weight. <laughs> it's unfortunate. There, you know, lawyers know how to get you out of informed consent, and I say that being the, the parent of two lawyers. They, you know, it doesn't carry a lot of weight, and don't worry. They can't throw you out of the hospital if you refuse to sign something or if you want to add something to the informed consent. Now, there are six things that you need to know about informed consent before you sign it. And I'm not going to go through each of them because we talk a little bit about them in the book and, and, you're, and you'll forget them. But if you even go on the website, you can look at what are the six steps for informed consent. It's important that your doc or your hospital goes through all these steps. <clears throat> You need to know, is this the best treatment? Is there an option? If I don't do this treatment, what will happen? If I do it, what will happen? You know, you have to be specific. And one of the most important things that has to be part of your informed consent is asking your doctor if you're going to have surgery, OK? And I'm really strong on this. If you're going to have surgery, there's no reason why you can't look up or you can't ask your doc of the last hundred procedures that you had done that are similar to mine, what is your infection rate? Okay? If he says, don't worry, it's not a problem, you need to find another doc. If he says my percentage is X or, or Y, then you say, okay, thank you, and, and you note that, and then you can go and look and find out if that's within the norm. Okay, and the way you do that is you simply can go in the state of Pennsylvania and in 36 other states, you can go to a state website. In Philadelphia, it's pa.gov. <clears throat> you could look under hospital acquired infections and you can get a printout of every hospital in Pennsylvania. And you can look on this type of sheet and you can look at a procedure, for instance, in this Hospital X for cardiac procedures, they tell you how many this hospital had, what they were expected to have, they can tell you, for instance, uh, this hospital should have more, no more than six infections. And that number will be here. If you look on the column for the procedure that you're going to have, and that hospital has 10, well, you don't want to have your procedure there. So very simple. It's there. You can go to Medicare.gov. 
you can actually put in a hospital's name. For instance, in this particular hospital, it says uh, for surgical site infections, the number of infections that they had were 110. This hospital was supposed to only have 54. So they put a note, this hospital is worse than the national average. So you don't go to that hospital. And it's by procedure. So there's no reason why you should go and have a surgical procedure done if you do not know what the infection rate is for that particular uh, procedure for that particular hospital. And people will say, well, I don't know. You know, if I ask my surgeon, he's going to feel bad. You know, you're not there when you go into a hospital or see a surgeon or a doc. You're not there to make friends. Okay. And I always say, and I know this is terrible, you know, and I'm notorious for not being on the negative side of this, but, you know, if you go in and see your loved one in a hospital and everyone is smiley and saying, hello, Mrs. Larkins, this is really great, nice to see you, you got to be concerned that you're not being a good advocate because if you're a good advocate, they don't want to see you. Okay, they don't want to see you. Oh, here she comes. Okay, the other thing is you don't leave people alone in the hospital. You just don't. You know, and most hospitals know that they're not going to be throwing you out. You know, so, you know, there's some things that you need to be aware of when you become a patient in the hospital. Let me ask, let anybody go on a vacation recently? Yeah. How long, how many hours did you spend um, planning that vacation? Like from the time you said, okay, I'm going to go to wherever abroad. You know, how much time did you spend planning that trip? 2030. Okay. Anybody recently buy a car? Yeah, I know you did. How much time did you spend? 18 months. 18 months. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if this is appropriate. Anybody, when you change jobs, if, if people are, are working or not, you spend a lot of time. Well, they surveyed people in the US and they asked them, how much time did you spend investigating your surgeon before you had the procedure? Less than one hour. That was the norm of what people spend. And it's true, you just go in with blind faith and okay, you know, this is a good thing to do. We just finished a Robert Wood Johnson Fellowship Grant, okay, Foundation Grant, and I teamed up with people at Northwestern School of Law and the University of Illinois, and we were looking at consumer awareness um, of hospital-acquired infections, and if people knew where to go and get this data. We actually just published this uh, in the American Journal of Medical Quality. And what we found, which is so surprising, and I found this in, in another, um, studies that I've done is the higher your income and the higher your education, the less likely you are going to question what is going on. Okay, so why? You know, people say, why? It just makes a lot of sense to me because <laughs> maybe being in Philadelphia, we think we go to the best doctor, the best hospital, and for CHOP it is. And for CHOP it is. <laughs> You know, I always say to people, you're crazy, you don't take your kids to CHOP. But, you know, we go to the best hospital, the best surgeon, so therefore I have the best, I don't have to worry. And it just seems that people who had less than a high school education, ma making less than $25,000 a year, knew more about where to get this information. Okay, because I think in their mind they're thinking, I had to worry about this. I suppose I'm not the, getting the best care. Okay, so we have people over here, we got the best care, and we have people over here, I don't trust them. Okay, so it's really interesting, so you need to think about that. And we were just so surprised, and, and let me tell you, the answer to our big question was, people are clueless in the U.S. that these reports even exist. Okay, they have no idea, to the point where over 90% did not know where to go get these reports or how to read them. And of interest is the 14 plus states who didn't have reports, those people thought they had them. So we have no idea, even though we have all these laws and all this money that's being spent in our individual states to collect this data, and we're not getting it to the consumer. So that's what it's about, you know, getting it to you people before you become um, a hospitalized patient. 